Jack Shepard was an infamous thief in 18th century London who left authorities scrambling and townsfolk fangirling. With four separate prison escapes in less than one year, the cat and mouse game between Jack and his pursuers was the talk of London town in 1724. Welcome to Crimes from History. Jack was a sickly infant born in 1702 to a poor carpenter's family in Spitalfields in London's East End, mere metres from what would become the stomping grounds of another Jack and the most notorious mystery in criminal history, which I will cover at some point. It was on this very spot, here, behind um, Liddles, that the body of Jack's first victim was found. She can still be heard walking these streets tapping on windows and going on about it. <laughs> but back to our Jack, Jack Shepherd, whose parents baptised him at St Dunstan's Stepney the day after he was born. This haste indicated a fear of infant mortality, perhaps brought about by his frail, sickly condition. Jack was named after his older brother who died before he was born. His father and younger sister died within a few short years of his birth and Jack's poor mother would be left to raise him and his older brother Thomas alone. When Jack was just six years old, his mother, unable to support the two children, sent him to Mr. Garrett's school, a somewhat grand name for a workhouse in Bishopsgate. Jack found himself working as a parish apprentice to a chairmaker. After his master's passing, Jack would work for another man doing the same job, but was treated very poorly. Please, sir. I want some more. <coughs> Until age 10, Jack would become a shop boy for Mr. William Kneebone. Mr. Kneebone was a wool draper and a shop owner in the fancy Strand area of central London. He had employed Jack's mum since her husband's passing, and he'd even taught Jack how to read and write. Come on, all right, see, this is what I'm talking about, illiteracy. You know, what does that word even mean? It's, come on. He was a lovely man. Using his connections, Mr. Kneebone got Jack an apprenticeship in Witch Street at the budding age of 15, and Jack signed away his life in a seven-year contract with his new employer, who would teach him the noble trade of carpentry. Life was looking up for Jack. Despite the death of his father and two siblings, his mother's perpetually impoverished state and the whole child labour thing, Jack's future looked bright. Fast forward to 1722, with five years of perfect conduct under his belt, Jack was a promising carpenter. Physically, he was a small, scrawny man, sprouting at just five foot four inches, but was known to be deceptively strong. I'll go get it. He had a pale face with large dark eyes, a wide mouth and a ready smile. Witty was the man Jack, who was popular in the taverns of Drury Lane. Yes, I know the muffin man. Who lives on Drury Lane? Despite the slight stutter he had developed, he was a confident and well-liked young man. Life was simple, life was good. That is, until he rocked up to a pub called the Black Lion. Here, strong ale, women of the night and ne'er-do-wells all converged for a good time, which could of course land any sensible lad like Jack in trouble if not careful. And, not being careful, Jack found himself visiting the Black Lion more and more as he developed an attachment to the strong drink, as equally as to a prospect by the name of Elizabeth Lyon, who had caught his eye. Hello, darling. Where you been all my life? Jack would later claim that his regular attendance at the Black Lion was the start of his downward spiral into crime. Oh God, I'm a fire starter, a twisted fire starter. Indulging in this hedonistic lifestyle meant Jack lost sight of his carpentry and became disobedient to his master. With the encouragement of his lady friend, Miss Lyon, and like so many fallen heroes do, he turned to crime to supplement his dwindling wages. Do not demonize this man. He's not a monster. I merely ask you to consider that he may be a bit of a dick. In spring of 1723, Jack began a string of crimes, starting with petty theft of a couple of spoons from a nearby shop. 
He then escalated to swiping valuables from the homes he found himself working in as an apprentice. Needing more time for his thievery, in August of that same year, Jack decided to quit his apprenticeship but continued to work as a carpenter. Over time, Jack progressed from petty thefts to full-on burglary, ultimately finding himself working cagey jobs alongside members of Jonathan Wilde's crooked gang. Wilde was a prolific criminal who often frequented Jack's favourite booze house, the Black Lion. Before he could fall into too much trouble with Wilde's gang, Jack moved to Fulham with his sweetheart Elizabeth Lyon until she was arrested for doing Lord knows what. What is the charge? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese meal? She was imprisoned at St Giles's Roundhouse. Jack was worried sick for his beloved and tried repeatedly to see her, but would be denied time after time by the warden. So what did Jack do? Well, Jack broke in and stole Elizabeth away from her jail cell on the 5th of February, 1720. Following their great escape, Jack and Elizabeth, accompanied by Jack's brother Tom, went on a thieving spree. Feeling like a million bucks, or I don't know, guineas, Jack and Elizabeth walked away quite satisfied with their haul, but Tom felt uneasy by what had taken place. Tom, following in his father and brother's footsteps, was a carpenter and had just recently been convicted of stealing tools from his employer. His punishment for that was to be burned on his hand and his scarred skin was a reminder of the consequences for his dishonest criminal behaviour. Tom was arrested a little over two months after stealing from his employer. Fearing a previous offence would lead him to be hanged if found guilty, Tom snitched on his brother Jack. You know what snitching does? Hey, what do we do with snitches in this bitch? Go by a rule, snitches get stitches. A warrant was issued for Jack's arrest. Word got round about Jack's involvement with the theft, and sensing profit in his arrest, gang leader Jonathan Wilde jumped at the opportunity to set up his former ally. Yippee! Wilde had one of his men, James Helland Fury Sykes, challenge Jack to a friendly game of Skittles at a pub near Seven Dials. Can we just take a minute to appreciate the power of the nickname James Hell and Fury Sykes? Power! That sounds like a guy who was never messed with. But Jack realised he'd been betrayed when a constable arrived and he was arrested. James Helen Fury Sykes was given a handsome £40 reward, or just over four and a half grand in today's money, for his assistance, which he shared with Wilde. Jack was imprisoned overnight on the top floor of St Giles's Roundhouse, ooh, the penthouse. He was to be questioned further in the morning, but questioning wouldn't occur the following morning because Jack escaped within three hours by breaking through the wooden ceiling and lowering himself to the ground with a rope fashioned from bedding. Jack, still in handcuffs, slipped into the crowd of people that had gathered upon hearing of a jailbreak. Hidden in plain sight, he pointed to some shadows on the roof, shouting that he could see the escapee, and when attention was excitedly turned in the opposite direction, he swiftly slipped into the night. And like that, he's gone. On the 19th of May 1724, Jack was arrested for a second time, caught in the act of picking a pocket in Leicester Fields, near present-day Leicester Square. He was detained overnight in Soho and visited there the next day by Elizabeth, but she was soon recognised as Jack's other half and was locked in the cell with him for her earlier prison escape. The couple were sent to the new prison in Clerkenwell, from where, after just a few days, they escaped. The two had filed through their shackles, removed the bars from their window, and again had utilised knotted bedsheets to lower themselves to freedom. Upon reaching the ground, Jack and Elizabeth realised they had unwittingly broken out of one prison, only to be locked in the yard of another, the neighbouring Bridewell prison, with its 22-foot gates blocking their path to liberty. Remember that Jack was not the tallest of chaps, and apparently Elizabeth was not the smallest of women. In spite of the added challenge, the two struggled over the gate in a somewhat ungainly fashion, successfully escaping. The event was heavily publicised, not only for the absurdity of yet another prison break. You're joking. Not another one? But for the imagined spectacle of a short man and a buxom lady hoisting themselves over a 22-foot wall, it was the height of 18th century slapstick humour that was going to help sell a lot of stories. The news of Jack's second escape circulated, eventually reaching the waggling ears of Jonathan Wilde, who determined if you can't beat them, then join them, or force them to join you. Wilde demanded that Jack became his stolen goods jockey and hand over all his thieved treasures for Wilde to resell. 
Jack, knowing that he would be getting the short end of a particularly shitty stick from a guy who had betrayed him once already, decided to work with another well-known mischief maker instead, Joseph Blueskin Blake. He is blue. Really, truly blue. Coming out, yes, you are blue. Oh <laughs> you are blue. You are blue. All right. You're blue. Blue, blue. You are blue. <laughs> Why was he named Blueskin? Who knows? Research won't help. Nobody knows, but he looks pretty blue. Birthmark, maybe? Maybe he drank colloidal silver like the bloke on Oprah. Anyway, Jack and Blueskin had been first introduced at the good old Black Lion Tavern. They would become thick as thieves and go on to commit a string of daring robberies over the next couple of months and funnel their stolen goods through one of Wilde's men, William Field. You'd think that this would set alarm bells off in Jack's head considering the close connection to dodgy Jonathan Wilde, but let's face it, everyone's dodgy in this story. It's just a case of figuring out who was the least dodgy person to help Jack shift his goods. Well, and surprisingly, it didn't turn out to be William Field, as this partnership would ultimately be Jack's undoing. I don't think you know. You play with feathers, you get your ass tickled. Jonathan Wilde had determined that Jack was a threat to the success of his operation and had to be dealt with. So Wilde employed the help of his man, William Field, to keep an eye on Jack and gather intelligence that could help Wilde get Jack off the streets and into a prison cell. On a quiet Sunday on the 12th of July, 1724, Blueskin and Jack did the unthinkable. The pair broke into the home of Mr. Kneebone. Jack's former master, the lovely man who employed he and his mother when they had nothing and taught him to read and write. They absolutely ransacked the place and stole 180 yards of woolen cloth, which they stashed in a stable in Westminster. They contacted William Field to line up a buyer for the stolen wool, and the three met at the stable to discuss business and inspect the newly acquired bounty. After Jack and Blueskin had left, William Field snuck back into the stable and he only went and robbed the bloody place. Field delivered the goods and imparted information of Jack and Blueskin's crime to Wilde. With evidence in hand, Wilde and his men began the hunt for Jack. They believed that if anyone would give up Jack's whereabouts, it would be Elizabeth Lyon, whom Wilde found at a brandy shop in the East End, where Wilde proceeded to get her absolutely bladdered until she spilled the beans and told him exactly what he needed to know. With the help of his henchman, Quilt Arnold. These names sound like they're <laughs> straight out of Toast of London. Neck, cock -a -boo, peanut whistle, Una length, dick weirdly, sow commotion, Scott Chestnut, Basil Watchfair, Iqbal Achieve. Nan Slack, Giuseppe Race, even he's got pursuit. Quilt Arnold and Wilde soon apprehended Jack and delivered him to Newgate Prison, where he was prosecuted on three charges of theft. Jack was acquitted of the first two charges due to a lack of evidence. Things were looking good until the third charge was heard, upheld, and to the unbridled joy of Wilde, Jack was convicted of theft and sentenced to death based on poor old Mr. Kneebone's testimony. In Newgate Prison, there was an area where visitors and inmates could meet. On one side, the prisoner was in a room with a window covered by iron bars that looked out to the main corridor of the jail, where visitors could look in and speak to the prisoner. Jack decided to attempt his escape through said iron bars and down the corridor to freedom when Elizabeth and her friend, Paul Maggot, came for a visit. Paul Maggot! That has to be a mistake. Just double checked. These are all real names. With the ladies acting as a distraction to the guards, Jack soared through the iron bars. How distracted were the guards not to clock that? Well, we can probably imagine. Jack then adorned ladies' clothing provided by Elizabeth and Paul and was successfully smuggled out of Newgate Prison. <laughs> Not only was Jack a free man once again, but he was now firmly considered to be a celebrity and even had tabloid nicknames such as Gentleman Jack, Jack the Lad and Honest Jack. With each escape, the publicity surrounding Jack grew and he was hailed a hero by many for his cocky attitude, good looks and cunning, non-violent nature. Songs, plays and pictures were produced depicting his escapades and Jack would continue to be the muse of many an artiste for hundreds of years to come. An old acquaintance of Jack's called, oh god, how weird is this name going to be? Mr. Page. Oh, that's disappointingly normal. 
So Mr Page spoke with some of the big knobs at the prison in an attempt to use Jack's celebrity status to get him out of trouble. However, Mr Page's appeals fell on deaf ears and the manhunt was well underway. Jack spent a few days visiting family in Northamptonshire and managed to evade capture by Wilde and his men who had volunteered their services to help authorities locate the notorious escape artist. But he was captured and arrested again on the 9th of September 1724 by a posse from Newgate on his return to London. With his newfound fame, Jack was visited in prison by the good, the bad and the curious. He was caught with files and other tools on multiple occasions and, not wanting to be embarrassed by any further outbreaks, the guards transferred Jack to a strong room in Newgate known as the Castle, where he was handcuffed, put into leg irons and chained to metal bars in the floor. On the 15th of October, Jack's partner in crime, Blueskin, was also tried and convicted for the burglary of Mr. Kneebone's home, with Wild and Field producing evidence at his trial. Blueskin was absolutely enraged and lunged across the courtroom, slashing Wild's neck. Wild would survive, but the incident meant a lot of recovery time, during which his criminal empire would decline. Blueskin's attack on Wilde led to complete chaos in the courtroom. Jack took advantage of the moment and, as guards rushed to assist in the courtroom, he used the time to pick the locks of his handcuffs and leg irons. He removed an iron bar from inside the chimney and used it to break through the ceiling of his room. After climbing into the room above, Jack proceeded to break through a heavy wooden door and from there climbed to the roof, where he clambered onto the roof of the adjacent house and scuttled off into the night. You son of a bitch! The event marked Jack's fourth successful prison outbreak. He hid in a cowshed in Tottenham, but when spotted by the barn owner, Jack lied and said he'd escaped from a different prison where he was being held for failure to pay child support. After several days, he went to stay at the house of his mistress, Kate Cook, then returned to the city of London and broke into a pawn shop. Jack stole everything he needed for one last night on the town. Big summer blowout. A black silk suit, a silver sword, diamond rings, watches and a fancy wig. He appeared quite the dapper gentleman and spent the next two nights drinking himself silly, gambling and enjoying the company of ladies of the night. On the morning of the 1st of November 1724, Jack was arrested for a fifth and final time. He was imprisoned once again in Newgate, this time in a room where he could be watched 24-7 and was loaded with 300 pounds of iron weights to prevent any escape attempt. Jack was a legend and guards would charge handsomely for people to see him in captivity. Some even sent petitions to King George I begging for him to pardon and release Jack. In court, Jack was given the chance to inform on his associates and reduce his sentence, but he refused. I'm a rat. I ain't no snitch. <laughs> Blueskin was hanged, and a week after, Jack was taken to the gallows at Tyburn to face the same fate. He planned one more escape, but the penknife he intended to cut the hangman's rope with was found by a prison warder shortly before he left Newgate for the last time. A joyous procession passed through the streets of London, with Shepherd's Cart drawn along Hoban and Oxford Street. A crowd of 200,000 people convened in the streets to celebrate Jack's life, halting briefly so he could down a pint before being hanged. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.